for inviting me over. It's true, we're over at the film school. We don't often you know, mix it up, so it's nice to get, get out of the uh, stadium for a minute. Um, so as Martin explained my background, um, mostly I'm a you know, Hollywood um, storyteller. Um, this was my first, first um, foray into, um, usually I am a sort of behind the scenes person and I advise others, um, sort of like a book editor. Um, and work with the, uh, the screenwriters and the directors about how to shape their projects. Um, this was um, something that I did with the graduate students here at the film school um, to go down to Grenada and do this documentary. And the reason why I'm interested in it, I think if you look at any sort of you know, filmmaker, perhaps maybe authors, but I think more in terms of movies, um, you can see that they often go back to the same theme. You know, they sort of examine, you know, Scorsese does similar type of stories and um, people who are sort of interested in, in something and they sort of play it out in their work. And I think in mine, I'm interested in a, a legacies, emotional legacies from slavery or psychological legacies. Um, from different things. And the reason why I was interested in, in Grenada is my father's Grenadian. So sort of an organic sort of development for me. Um, and I grew up partly in Antigua. Um, he was director of the Peace Corps in the Leeward Islands for a while. And um, so we'd often uh, spend our Christmases in Grenada. And um, I couldn't help but notice, you know, how British, you know, it seemed to sort of maintain itself. And, and that was certainly true in Antigua as well. And sometimes that'd be a source of frustration. I'd be like, why, you know, you know, we'd sort of be a brash American. And I, um, but then also I should mention that my, as you heard, um, um, that my, that uh, Sir Paul Schoon, um, was uh, my, we call them uncle. I mean, I'm not exactly sure it's technically how we're related, but in that general sense, he might have been a cousin to my father or something. Um, and so often we would visit with him too. And I wanted to um, examine the legacy of colonialism, um, starting with the Caribs, you know, starting, you know, in, because basically my basic thought is it's very difficult to get rid of the psychological legacies of you know, slavery or colonialism or the combination. And I could see it sort of manifesting itself and even sort of being supported you know, um, with people. I think we do that in our country as well, obviously, as we sort of wrestle with issues from slavery and, and continue to do that. And so, um, so that was my thought, was to look at various times in history for, I picked four different times in Grenada's history where I thought people, the population, had tried to fight against the effects of colonialism. Um, and also, I looked at how sometimes, uh, despite wanting to get rid of that very thing, they might employ the tools of colonialism in order to get rid of it, and sort of the sort of cycle um, that I saw sort of um, continuing. It is difficult, and I think that, um, you know, one of the things that I think I experienced when I share this with a Grenadian audience um, or, you know, West Indian, but mostly Grenadian, I suppose, is a, aside from what it's talking about, it's just a, a lot of hunger for images of their history, um, of which we have perhaps, you know, you know, that with the History Channel and so many, you know, channels that we've been allowed to sort of see our history kind of replayed, replayed. And now for the U.S., um, we see it replayed in, in drama, dramatization. So we're really getting a lot, you know what I mean? Um, of imagery, and there they don't have that all sort of cohesive in one one place. So um, certainly things were, um, you know, destroyed. I mean, hurt by the um, you know intervention, invasion, but then also hurricanes and things like that. You know, can flood out. You know, basements. You know, like maybe they're keeping the stuff in the basement, and it'll just get flooded, and then oh well, that's it. That it's all gone for good. Do you know? And and the archives. Um, you know, obviously don't have the, you know, don't have the, where, the financial wherewithal to really preserve things. So it's like newspapers with open windows with the seawater. So it's like, well, you know, it's just not going to last for long. You know what I mean? So the way we sort of went about it was, um, well, some people just had things in their house, like um, George Brazan, um, who's a great historian, also was a prime minister for Grenada and just a, a big intellectual there, you know, it's had some things in his house that we were able to sort of, you know, take pictures of. Um, and then I think um, there was a photographer there who has a gallery and he took a lot of the pictures of um, um, Eric Gary and things like that. So it's sort of like um, 
one of the things about you know Grenada is a small enough environment that you meet one person, they send you to another person, and and um, um, and usually we got a lot of stuff, and you can see sort of if you look at sort of the books that come out of Grenada, we repeat the images. Do you know what I mean? Because there's certain there's only a certain amount, but I did end up going to the Library of Congress. Um, for some of the things there. Um, I mean, I probably got some of the stuff from Time Magazine and, you know, some of the from Vanderbilt, you know, with their um, little news clips and, and things like that. So it's definitely a scattered effort, you know, and it took a while to sort of pull together. Plus, you know, since I work here, I went to the FSU library, you just looked up old books, you know, and I know that these, the rights are not a problem anymore, you know, from something that was written hundreds of years ago, so I could just take those images. Um, so it did take a lot of hunting and pecking, and hunting and pecking, and hunting and pecking to sort of get enough, as we call it, you know, in industry B-roll, you know, to support what, you know, um, you know, support all the talking heads. So that took a while. I, I actually did think that one of the reasons why I wanted to do this um, documentary, and also I got help from the um, FAVICA, which maybe you guys are sort of aware of, the Florida Volunteer Corps. Um, it was sort of more robust when I started this whole thing, but basically, um, they, they will support you for like a week to go down to the Caribbean. Um, so whatever, like if you're a beekeeper, you can go to, a, if, if somebody in the Caribbean island invites you, you know, say like an Antigua to come and teach them about beekeeping, you know, they will pay for that week's trip. It's kind of like being like a Peace Corps volunteer for like a week, you know, um, so you come down and, um, and do that. And so this, this part of this idea was a historical preservation and oral history. So that I figured that all my interviews, even the ones outside of the stuff that I use, because obviously I've got a lot more material than what cuts into the documentary, um, you know, I could sort of cut together a sort of archival oral history stuff, you know, for the archives there, just, you know, the people have at will, since they may not have, um, you know, as much material on, some, on George Brazan or that kind of thing. I did find that um, mostly, uh, well, in the past, like when they were talking about the revolution, I mean, they would talk openly about the conflict between the generations because one of the things that shifted um, or that uh, for young people and, and their parents at that period of time was, well, one, you know, the belief, you know, people who came up under Gary, you know, were like, hey, you know, we, he did change our lives and we're not going to just throw him away because he's, you know, whatever, he's not perfect. Or, but, you know, then so they had a lot of loyalty to him and didn't want to have him discuss. I think one of the guys I was interviewing, you know, his mother was a real you know, really supportive of Eric Gary, and so, but one of the things that also that the revolution I, uh, will seem to be suggesting is that, you know, think for yourself, you know, you know, don't necessarily follow along with that, you know, sort of way of thought, and um, your loyalty is to the movement, not necessarily to your family, you know, depending on whether, what your family was up to, you know, which was a, a completely different way of thinking with, you know, how the West Indians or the uh, Grenadians have been thinking, you know, the mother and father, you know, they, that's it. I told you that, that's over, we're not talking about it anymore. And so the idea of moving away from that was, you know, definitely a problem. You know, I suppose not that different from the, well, different, but similar to the 1960s in our country, you know, with, you know, people moving, you know, anti-war, you know, from the World War II generation, and then you get the, the younger people um, rebelling against that. You know what I mean? So yes, there was definitely some friction there. Um, and then now, you know, when I was interviewing sort of in the modern era, like right now, I found that there was, um, the con it wasn't so much conflict as everything had sort of, sort of gone underground. And that when young people saw it, like at the university, you know, a lot of them just didn't know a lot of this stuff because it doesn't get talked about openly that much, you know, there. So they're like, well, you know, they didn't, they, they were hungry to sort of hear the details. And I think that part of the silence that happens is because you know, all the people who, you know, who, who were involved and took sides in the revolution now live and work together. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, you know, he may have been a revolutionary, but now he's at the government working in the Department of, you know, farming or whatever. You know what I mean? Alongside this other person who did something else. And it's really small, so it's, they just don't talk about it because otherwise it'd just be, you know, it wouldn't be able to get along, you know. So, but the next generation doesn't hear anything, and so they're, they're, I don't know if it's conflict as much as sort of there's this an odd um, lack of education about that. But you know, um, I think that's not. You know, we I think a lot of cultures have that when you when you have something that's really explosive, then then that generation doesn't want to talk about it, and the subsequent generations are kind of confused as to like what what's happening. I um, had an idea. I mean, I had my hypothesis of what I believe to be true. Um, 
but I, but I didn't know exactly how I was going to find it. Do you know what I mean? So um, that's the thing about documentaries. You, you think you, you have an idea. You start the documentary with an idea of what you're going to find, but it's not until you actually do the interviews and get all the things that you can sort of figure out, you know, how much of that is you're going to, you know, it starts to, you know, it leads you to how you can sort of shape it, unlike a narrative where you can just kind of shape the clay exactly the way you want to when it's a narrative. But with a documentary, it's like, you know, you're sort of um, locked into. But, I mean, obviously I... I went with a certain, I didn't want to take sides, you know, and I, that was really important because I thought if I took sides, then one, I don't have enough information to take a side, really. And then two, no one would listen to me. They would just be like mad, you know, I just make, you know, I just make people mad one way or the other. And so I just wanted to just look at this idea of colonialism and how it, you know, how it affects people, you know, even when they're trying to get rid of it. So I just try to keep a bead on that and then everything else sort of. Actually, he is, um, he lives here in, in Tallahassee. I didn't want to have, you know, my voice because it's, you know, not the right kind of voice. Well, I wanted somebody who had, um, you know, a little bit of a, well, he, he's Grenadian. So I wanted somebody with an accent, you know, who looked, seemed like they're Grenadian, but, could, but anybody could understand them. So not so thick that you're like, what, you know, or that you have to, um, you know, you have to sort of add um, subtitles. Do you know what I mean? So... Turns out um, that he lives here, and actually he used to be a, um, he used to be active in the revolution, actually. <laughs> so he, um, you know, critiqued my documentary and gave me some tips, but, um, <laughs> which I appreciated, which I appreciate. I'm, it's all about collaboration in the movie business, so it's no, no, no problem. But um, he lives here, and he's, but when he was there, he was actually a, um, a DJ or somebody on the radio, you know, so, um, so that's why his voice, you know, he's sort of, you know, comfortable with that. Um, so I just, um, uh, you know, met him and, you know, asked him if he wanted to come over to the film school and, <laughs> and do the narration. No, I, I didn't. I mean, well, I think I started out, um, it wasn't necessary, you know, because I, I wasn't really planning on it, but then um, it turned out, I mean, I wanted to use people who, um, you know, uh, professors and thinkers and intellectuals and other people who lived and experienced it um, um, because I figured, well, you know, well, who could argue against that perspective, you know what I mean? And so it just turned out that I, I had a plenty, you know what I mean? So it wasn't like I ran out of people to talk to and that I needed um, um, somebody outside. I mean, I wouldn't have, if I had needed it, I would have used it, but I don't think I needed it, so, yeah. Well, generally speaking, I think people were... Um, you know, welcoming about it. I think the thing that gave me a, a pass, I don't know if they see me as completely American. They see me as sort of, um, what is it called? Um, you know, it's not, not exactly a just come back, but, you know, almost, you know what I mean? You know, um, um, so they see me, they recognize that I have a strong Caribbean heritage, you know what I mean, that I grew up in the Caribbean, um, that my father is Grenadian, that he brings me there every Christmas, you know what I mean, that I have active relationships with my cousins, you know what I mean, um, that it's not a, you know, it's not a, um, a foreign place to me. So I don't think, I don't know how it would have felt if they literally saw me as an American who had never stepped foot on the place before. But I think they saw me as a West Indian, they say they claim me as a, as a, as a Caribbean, you know, person who happens to also, you know, have an American mother who, you know. Um, and also, Sir Paul Schoon um, um, was alive then. And so, you know, the fact that he was, you know, um, willing to be in this thing, I'm sure, signaled to others of his long-term friends. I mean, and the, and like I said, the island is small that, you know, he and Morris Bishop used to play tennis together, you know what I mean? He taught him Latin in high school, you know what I mean? So it's a, you know, so, you know, um, so everybody knows everybody, you know what I mean? So I think that the fact that he, you know, blessed it by, by you know, allowing me to interview, obviously signaled to other people that, you know, they thought it was okay. Um, and then my dad, you know, so really my heritage, I can't, I don't know if they saw me completely as a flat out American coming down. But that would have been an interesting idea to have done that. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that that would have been, I think um, I was mostly being driven, I think, by the, and I mean, art could have still played a role, but I think I was being driven by the historical times. Do you know what I mean? So I was like, who knows about Fadon? You know, who knows about, you know, the Caribs? Who knows about um, um, Eric Gary? Do you know what I mean? But I, I definitely think that you could have still, you know, one could have threaded that, that line in there a little bit. And you see it, I mean, I'm using some of the images from the artist. I just didn't comment on it as, as the art. But, you know, somebody obviously painted, you know, a picture of Fadon that gets used a lot. And then 
Um, because no one knows what he looked like, so you just have to imagine, you know, what he may have looked like. Um, and, and some of the artwork around Eric Gary, you know, that, pa that painting suggesting that he, I mean, it's a sort of photograph, but it's sort of montage in a way, or um, where um, it suggests his, you know, maybe um, the art, the, the photographer is suggesting a sort of distortion of person, you know, and so that was really part of it, yeah. Well, it was really uh, serendipitous, it's just a coincidence, really. Um, but I was at the library in Grenada and um, with my sister, and we were just trying to get more more archival stuff, more pictures or whatever. And um, we looked up, and I thought, "Wait, is that Bernard Cord?" <laughs> so that's really how it happened, you know. <laughs> so I was like, "I was like, I think that's him," you know. Of course, he looks different because he's lost weight from the pictures of when he was younger, but you know, we could still see that it was him. So we went up and asked him, you know, if it was him, and you know, I explained about my documentary and. You know, when you asked about you know, colonialism, everybody resonates with colonialism. I mean, if you, it doesn't matter what country you come from. You know, you could be from an African country or you could be, you know, from India or you could be from wherever. When you say colonialism, you know, and the sort of, you know, psychological issues, everybody just kind of relates to it. And every, nobody has a problem discussing the problems with colonialism, you know, that I found. You know, everybody's happy to talk about that, you know. Um, because it's it's such a defining and continues to you know uh, shape people. So anyway, he 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 said he would be willing to have the interview. So we went to um, a friend of his house, um, and uh, my sister is an attorney, and she's she helped a lot with the question. I mean, she's she's she does a lot of um, trial. She does trials. She does a lot of depositions. So she knows how to keep somebody on track when, you know, when she's trying to, and it wasn't easy. Let me put it that way. He definitely was, you know, talked a lot about the revolution, um, and his own interpretation of what was that, but, you know, we just have to pull him back. Well, actually this documentary is about this, you know what I mean? So then we go back to like colonialism and then he would, you know, specifically answer the question, but he, de I mean, I definitely have things that where he's talking about other parts of his whole, um, perspective. You know, but I think um, it wasn't. It's not easy, and I think my sister did play a, a helpful role there in that she can kind of, you know, get the person to come back to the point that she's trying to build a case for. So, but um, yeah, I think everybody wants to talk about what they want to talk about, and I think the trick is to allow them to do that to some degree because otherwise they get frustrated. Do you know what I mean? It's like you have to allow people to say something, and maybe they'll say something that will allow you, that you'll surprisingly be able to include. But I think it's obviously you have to, you know, tell them, you know, well, in order for me to use this stuff, I need to actually have you talk about the topic, you know, otherwise it won't show up there. I think the reception, generally speaking, has been good. I mean, I think that. Um, Grenada, we, that was one, of course, I was, you know, nervous about, but it actually went, you know, well, no one, I mean, everybody, I think, what I've been told later is that people come in thinking I'm going to take a side, and then they realize I didn't, and then they're sort of, like, just interested in thinking about the legacy of colonialism and, and, and being interested in the images. So I've only, I think people will sometimes ask me, you know, um, well, what happened next? Like, in other words, you know, um, where Shalina's document, where her, where her work goes, you know, I'll get questions like that, but, or occasionally, um, um, but generally speaking, I think the reception has, has been positive, actually, and um, people tend to want to, like, purchase it for libraries and things like that, which I have to sort of work out for them, because I think that was my, I, that's my plan to allow schools and libraries to sort of, to sort of have it. I think um, the most challenging audiences probably were um, I mean, so maybe in the Caribbean, maybe uh, sometimes when people, this happens too, when people just will bring up things that you didn't, weren't able to include perhaps, you know, so, but I think generally speaking, it's been a positive, a positive experience, yeah.